Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Change Physician Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Kukara, with my co-host, Dr. Melissa Cady. And today's guest is Dr. Heather Hammerstedt. And Dr. Hammerstedt is an emergency room physician um, who has expanded greatly beyond the ER and is making significant inroads in health on the online space. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> And um, before we get into what you are doing now, which is super interesting, I want to go back in time to that time and space before you entered med medical school and just simply ask you, why did you choose to go into medicine? Uh, the short answer is that my 14-year-old boyfriend told me girls couldn't be doctors. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm really stubborn. <laughs> so Keith, if you're listening, <laughs> um, longer answer is that I, I've just always wanted to help people with their health. I don't, I don't know why. There were no doctors in my family. Um, you know, I have, a, you know, PhD doctors, but no medical doctors in my family. And I just was really always interested in like how, how food and how your health and how movement kind of all played together. And, and I knew that I was good at sciences and figured I would give it a shot. And um, when I first went into medical school, and this will kind of come full circle when we get to talk about my company, Holist, but I was a ski bum living in Northern Montana. And I was like, just constantly attached to this book called Healing with Whole Foods by Paul Pritchard. It's a um, traditional mm. Chinese medicine book about how foods in, in TCM, you know, are used uh, for prevention or reversal of disease. And I was like, this is what I'm going to, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And of course, like, you know, got into medical school and there's nothing <laughs> about food or movement or mindfulness or how to control your thoughts or anything like that, that I think are just essential for health. Um, so when I was a fourth year med student, I actually went and got my health coaching certificate um, at the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, which was at that point an in an in person school in um, New York City, and um, really, I think that was a catalyst for me really being able to figure this out for myself and friends and family. Um, and that's kind of you know how how my medical school was. Wow! So you you started out so much earlier, recognizing the need for that skill set. I mean that that's impressive because I I don't meet many physicians that embark on that in the midst of, you know, medical school training. What made you decide to do emergency medicine? You obviously know lifestyle, that that was a, a key component you wanted to hone in on. Yeah, well, I was sure that I was going to be family medicine and I was going to have like a little co-op natural grocery store attached to my, uh, to my practice. And then I just fell in love with emergency medicine. I mean, I did it like early in my fourth year, I had already finished almost all my applications for family medicine. And I just realized that I just love the opportunity to make an impact at the time when someone really needs it, or you know, whether that's for an actual emergency or a perceived emergency. Um, and I'm really good at it. And so I just went, I kind of flipped, flipped on its head and just went for it and ended up matching at one of the Harvard residencies. And had a great experience learning emergency medicine there. And I've continued to enjoy my career in emergency medicine. I still do. Yeah. Now with COVID, it's a little bit more emotionally and physically uncomfortable, but <laughs> yeah. we still have a big role to play. Sure. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just getting to know you and I, I wonder um, in the choices between family and emergency medicine, I, I get a sense that you have a a dis please call me out on it if I'm wrong, but a decisiveness about you and, and taking charge and, and getting things done. Is that, is that yeah, accurate? That is accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I, a good organizer of, of things and tasks. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I do, just, I do love emergency medicine. I think, um, I think it's similar to family medicine and the fact that we have to know all of the things it's just that I have to know all of the acute, all of the things <laughs> and yes. they, uh, like of the, of the emergencies of everyone else's specialties, right? Like sometimes even more than the specialists themselves and family medicine, they have to know all of the general and chronic things. And so they're not so different. It's just that the way that we practice and where we practice is different. Sure. Well, I think a lot of this will become relevant when you look at the skill set and just the types of things you we were just talking about, the descriptors of who you are, um, are really relevant to 
where you've gone and where you're at now, which we'll, we'll get into later. But I think that skill set people don't realize it can come in really handy for um, getting into the online space and, and even being willing <laughs> to yeah. engage in that. Yeah. Um, so when you went into emergency medicine, were there uh, was there a realization that you wanted to do anything besides emergency medicine, or where where was that part of you that wanted? I mean, I'm assuming health coaching started getting into your career, your life somewhere along that line or after? Um, yeah. So for the first part of my career, um, so right after I did my residency at um, one of the Harvard programs, I stayed there to teach for a year. And while I was in, while I was there as faculty, I got my master's in public health and international global health policy. And um, the first, you know, 10 years of my career really focused around emergency medicine capacity development in East Africa. And we have a nonprofit that we run um, training uh, nurses to become uh, mid-level providers there, as well as helping support some new physician residencies in Uganda. Um, and, um, and so when you're talking about like a catalyst for change, right? Um, you know, we worked for 10 years to create, to get emergency medicine recognized in the country, to get the national curriculum to be accepted, to get the idea of educating emergency physicians and mid-levels to be accepted. And that was all, just took a ton of time and effort, um, all volunteer, tons of trips to Uganda. Um, the organization is called Global Emergency Care, if anyone's interested in looking us up. Um, and then it finally got to the point where all of those things lined up and were happening and our graduates started being able to take over some of the administrative work. And so that was in around 2017 when I got to be able to step back a little bit and sort of pick my head up and be like, okay, we've accomplished this great goal and I'm still involved and we're still working really hard, especially now with COVID. But um, you know, what, what else do I have that I can offer in a different way? And that's when I sort of started coming back to coaching. Wow. Let's explore that a little bit more then, because you know, your, your time is starting to open up. You're obviously a very driven person doing so much. Um, but why then did you choose to go into the online space as compared to, you know, developing health interventions directly in the ER in the, in the United States? Well, the first thing that I started doing is realizing that I was getting really sick of people coming in at three in the morning with things that they didn't need to be having, right? And realizing that I had the skills from health coaching, but also various other things we haven't even talked about of me putting my hands up for all sorts of stuff over the years and expanding kind of what I think of as healthcare into more, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, um, acupuncture, all those kind of things. And I obviously can't do those things in the emergency department. I mean, most people are, you know, are lucky if they see me for five minutes and if it's longer than that, they're really unlucky, right? <laughs> so, um, so, but I did start to figure out that I could come up with little nuggets of information that when people are there with you know, chest pain that they thought was an MI and in fact, it's esophageal spasm from reflux, right? They're still scared. They still came to the emergency department in the middle of the night. They might actually listen to me when I tell them the one to two minutes of, food and exercise and thought work, right? Whereas they, their primary doctor has probably been telling them that for years and they're, they weren't ready to hear it. And so that was kind of my first, my first work of trying to get this back in was trying to help the people who are right in front of me. And in fact, I created an online course for physicians to learn how to do that regardless of what their practice is so that they can get this lifestyle medicine, um, you know, whether they're certifying or not. Um, so that was the first part. Um, I guess also, um, you know, when I decided that I was sick of my time being required for me to get money <laughs> um, was right around when I left a medical director position in one of our emergency departments. And I, was, I wasn't burned out on emergency medicine. I was burned out on administration. And I was realizing I was just like feeling angry <laughs> all the time about all the things that I couldn't change. Um, and so I decided that if I was going to do something else, it was going to involve some of my skills, which is leading teams. It's figuring out who's really good at things that I'm not good at and putting us all together um, to kind of create a bigger pocket, but also something that wasn't going to need me all the time. So if you're going to open another brick and mortar place, 
um, whether it's you know in the hospital setting or whether it's your, your own clinic or something, it still requires, first of all, smaller market, but also requires me to be in a place for a certain amount of time. Whereas in the online world, you can automate so much that if you do it correctly, you can really scale quickly. And I didn't really understand all of that then, but I had at least the ideas of wanting a team and wanting it not to be just my time that was required. That's awesome. Yeah, so, so that spark then, when what, what was it you, about what made you choose the first, your first kind of tiptoe into the online space? What, what was your first foray there? Um, I get, so I, um, I decided to start with food. I have a, a very large vision for Holist <laughs> and we're only 10% into it. Um, but I started to start with food because I feel it so strongly that we use food for so many reasons besides just hunger. Um, and that so much of our food is processed and causing all these hormonal dysregulation issues that we have that are really leading to a ton of preventable disease. And I felt like that was probably the best bang for the buck, um, as well as understanding how many people need that information, right? So again, talking about market size. Um, so I just kind of threw it out there over Christmas, December, 2018, just to my small social media circles saying that I was doing this and who wanted me to experiment on them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got about 20 people and I built the program, the 12 week program that we currently have, um, by coaching those people and figuring out what it is that they needed to know and doing the research and doing it while I, while I was there. So realizing that like these people weren't all just here in Boise, Idaho, I started using Zoom and I started figuring out how I could automate the program so I could get it to them and I wasn't having to send emails every day and like those things. Um, but also realizing that if that was going to be the way that I was going to be running the company, it meant that you had to be more online, you had to be in social media. And so I started just trying to figure out what that looked like by doing Facebook live interviews and connecting with other physicians that were doing interesting things and sharing each other's work and just trying to learn how to not be afraid to put yourself out there. Really. That, that is a big, um, I think a big point is that there is, um, I guess we've talked about this in, in other interviews that, that physicians can be risk averse um, at times or things that we're not, you know, for type A, we want to know everything before we start it. And it's hard to kind of put your, you know, toe in the water to, to experience that. But can you... And even just being afraid people are going to judge you for doing yes. something different. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that is, that's something I know I, I went through myself is that you, you feel such a, you're so compelled to, you, you feel this mission like you really, it's almost like that mission has to pull you harder than that other concern about worrying about what other people think. So there it's, but there's still that moment. I'm sure even when you start putting yourself out and you feel that mission to do it, you're, you're kind of almost hoping that everything goes okay. And you just have to kind of build your confidence in that. Yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious you know, now. I just don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but that isn't that it's so true though. When, when you know that it takes courage right. and you know, you put yourself out there and you know, you're doing it for the right reasons. There is a point where you're just kind of like, I can't worry about what people think if I'm going to really, you know, follow through on this. Cause you can't just go half, you know what, into it. You, you really yeah. have to pour your heart and soul and sweat and tears and everything else into it. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. What, if there's anyone, you know, for physicians that are listening, um, is there any, you know, uh, advice you would give on how to deal with that mindset to shift yourself? I know it's, it's kind of a loaded question there, but what would be your advice if people are, you know, where you were at trying to discover social media and worrying about what people think? Um, I think just adopting the attitude that like you have value to offer and no one's going to hear about it if you don't put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is in realizing that like in a way you're providing service that way, right? Someone's going to find you and have their life changed by something that you are going to do. 
um, and realizing that, that, that this is just how things go. The other thing is, is um, there is something called the spotlight effect, which basically means that um, you know, y not everyone is paying as much attention to you as you think. <laughs> <laughs> and even for people that follow you, right, and like your content, like they're still not going to see every post or every video or every podcast, right? Um, so like you may think that you're putting a ton out there and be worried that you're like controlling people's feeds, but the more that they engage with you, the more they're going to see it. And so that's their choice in a way per the Facebook algorithms, right? Um, so yeah, just realizing that like people can scroll by and they don't have to watch. And even if I forget like 50% of what I'm going to say, it's still providing a ton of value for something that someone else didn't know. Right. So. Right. What would, what would you also say for, for physicians? Because um, we're seeing a transition now. I would say it was like a sea change transition with physicians moving into the online space, but it's been dominated by non-physicians for so long. So um, I would like be curious about words of encouragement that you would give to physicians. And you kind of touched on that with, this idea of value, uh, but maybe the physicians say, oh, I don't know enough to, to run a Facebook Live, or I don't know, may, uh, what, what, what would I say that somebody out there would find useful from a health standpoint? Well, there's a lot of people talking who have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> so, <laughs> good point. <laughs> and again, like, you know, you may not, like, un you know, unless you're, like, you're a nephrologist who's running, like, a, you know, a Facebook group just for other nephrologists, like people don't know as much as you do about what you know, right? And so it's just realizing that it doesn't have to be complete. Like it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be scripted. Like just like me starting my company, like I did it in real time, right? And so I just created as I went. And that meant that I have a better product because I was using it uh, I was, you know, using it on the people that were going to be using it, right? So um, I think just just realizing that, you know, that you anything you have to say has value and people still do look up to physicians. We just have to be part of the, the story because if there's only health coaches or wellness coaches or lifestyle coaches um, and there are no physicians at the table, we're doing the same thing that we did with the healthcare system, which is abdicate responsibility to running our own hospitals and businesses and stuff like that right we're, we're leaving it to people who don't know what we know yeah and so i'm i'm wondering about when you started this you know you did the facebook groups and you started you know experimenting on on your 20 people and my husband hmm. oh and your husband yeah. of course <laughs> yeah no, no one better um yeah. So when you did that, when was it that you, what was kind of the next step after you did that in order to, you know, bridge into, I mean, you've got a, a pretty big site here with lots going on. What, what was the next thing after that little experiment? Uh, then I got a second experiment group um, and I validated the fact that my program would work. Um, and I switched things around and I moved them. And then when I was done with that cohort, I was about six months in. And then I started hiring coaches, even though I couldn't afford it. Because I was, I, again, the goal of all this is for me to serve as many people as we can and reach as many people as we can. If that's limited by my time, um, then it's not going to happen. So, um, and then I, you know, created a website and I figured out how to automate everything. And I spent a ton of money and time on trying to figure out Facebook ads. <laughs> and, um, and then I started just kind of curating my team more and more kind of as we moved into wow. success. So you were doing full-time emergency medicine. Full-time momming. Yes. <laughs> and how many children? Two, six and Two. eight. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you've got a lot of jobs going on here. Yeah. <laughs> Full-time mom times two and yeah emergency medicine. And um, so how long you've been doing full-time emergency medicine now or up till now? Uh, 13 years. Okay. And so I know there's, there's, there's been, when did you start the, the full on website? How long ago was that? Um, I started the company Holist in January, 2018 and, okay. um, and started, you know, really pushing marketing and scaling uh, that summer. Um, wow. I would say my success turned 
last summer finally and so I, that's always something i want to be like very clear with people about is that like you can look at where we are right now and the revenue that we have and the team that we have but realize that like it took two years of failing forward and you just never know like what next step is going to be the one that, that pushes you over the edge but like if anyone's starting their own business you need to realize it's going to take a couple years it's going to take a lot of time and money invested to make it happen well that's the thing though you that i see that as actually pretty i mean considering i've been like playing with the online space maybe with a little bit less um you know uh, focus on one specific thing that i'm gonna head into you know the that's a short period of time to go in with trepidation with social media only a couple years ago and and embarking on this and turning and flipping it into you know a revenue generating uh business you now are from what we've before we went on air there's there's a shift happening now because of that uh progress do you want to allude to how how you're being changed as a physician just from this this two years of hard work yeah i mean um i i'm going part-time emergency medicine it's certainly not anything that i'm gonna ever leave i don't think because i do love it um but uh but this will open up some more time for me to have the family and 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 let my business you know scale with the teams that i've put in place and the systems i've put in place so it's exciting yeah. and i think that's important to emphasize is because um you know the other thing with physicians and you'll see physician talking about if, if you somehow leave clinical medicine in any way or transition away from it, people oh you're you're a bad doctor blah 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 but what you've done is not only are you, you have your emergency medicine practice, but with Holist, you are now doing what most of us went into medical school to do is to help people, but you're helping them at scale. Yeah. And I, I, I just, it's, it's just, a, it's amazing to see, it's an amazing to see your, your website here. Uh, I, I have to, to say though, the other part that I think is just amazing is, is your project management ability. Because mm -hmm. you've hit on this again and again, is your ability to, not only start something that's imperfect, which I think a lot of physicians, I think that gets beat out of us in a lot of ways in medicine. Yeah. And, you know, we're not, well, like I guess there's a lot of good reasons. You don't want to go and experiment on people and make a lot of mistakes when you're <laughs> practicing. But I, but I think we lose that. I think we lose that ability to think in some way. So I'm wondering, was that something that you carried through when you were working with your nonprofit or, or did you always have it? Or did you have to relearn that, that, that ability to, to, use learning or failure as learning yeah i think our work with global emergency care has been was really instrumental um i think i've always had an ability to manage a project by looking at different perspectives and i think my global emergency care team that's why they always had me kind of as executive director is just because that was my skill set um but i think that it helped me hone that kind of across cultures across you know think different things that people needed and understanding also that we couldn't just like roll into Uganda and be like, this is what emergency medicine looks like for you. It's like, how can we help you figure out what emergency medicine is to your country? And so I think that kind of let me get out of the driver's seat a little bit and be a little bit more of like a listener and an organizer, um, which is why, you know, why I think Holist came out to be the way that it was because what we're really trying to do is meet people where they are in their life and have them create a system of health for themselves that's going to be enjoyable but is still going to have them prevent and reverse disease um, instead of just mandating this is what you eat and when you eat and this is why you should be eating right um, so um, yeah I think I think global emergency care was really instrumental for me for that um, and like nothing nothing is going to go right all the time when you're working in a, in East Africa, <laughs> like it, the bus is going to break down and it's, it's going to be imperfect <laughs> and just being, you know, okay with that. Yeah. East Africa was the, the perfect uh, training ground for the online space where. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That you have to be, I mean, you essentially are describing this adaptability and flexibility that is critical. Yeah. Um, in those situations but um you know but in, in, in in a way though kevin like you're right because I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you melissa but oh go ahead um the you know we were running an organization in uganda on skype in 2008 right so managing people teaching courses like 
you know, hiring people. And like, sure, sometimes some of us were on the ground, but for the most part, like we were trying to implement the tools that are common now to run essentially, you know, a business, a nonprofit business um, there. And so, you know, I think it was natural for me to be like, well, of course we'll do it online, right? <laughs> Like, yeah. Why would you do it any other way? So. No, I think it's, it's, um, the power you, you recognize the power of online coaching and, um, and really helping, I mean, helping people. I mean, that's, I, I think it's archaic now for physicians. I mean, now people are a little more open-minded because of COVID and everything. Um, but there was so much resistance, um, before the whole COVID thing happened to, considering how we can make things more efficient, more convenient and more helpful and helping more people by having that online, you yeah. know, interaction. Yeah. I mean, and for me, just incredibly rewarding to, you know, to know that a process that I created is changing someone's life and to have them get on the phone with me at the end of their 12 weeks and be like, I can't believe I even thought about not doing this, you know, like, my sleep is better. My energy is better. I left that husband. I got a better job and I lost 25 pounds, right? You know, something like that. Whereas like in emergency medicine, if I'm thanked, you know, twice a year, it's like, it, it's amazing. Right. So. So um, we're, we've kind of mentioned a little bit, but could you describe what Holist is and what your sort of vision uh, from the beginning as to now of how that company has developed? Yeah. Um, so Holist is a lifestyle medicine coaching and consulting company where we assign um, coaches, two coaches to each client who comes in. One is a weight coach and the other is a mindset coach. Um, and those coaches help you figure out for yourself what and when and why you're eating. Because if it was just about the food, we wouldn't all be in this situation, right? Um, and basically help them implement like a 12 week kind of university level course that I put together on weight science and mindset around food. So the clients are learning, they're getting educated. So that empowers them to understand how their brain and their body works around food. And the coaches are helping them kind of really dial in like, why are you eating? What are the thoughts that you're having? These subconscious thoughts about how you use food, you know, how it was when you were a child, the way that, you know, your, the way that you feel about your body and trying to like, really kind of get at why most people use food as a buffer for uncomfortableness <laughs> instead of dealing with the uncomfortableness. And then the weight and food coaches are really working on experimenting with what and when each person is eating, um, trying to implement that coursework into their life so that they can find something that works for them, not just to lose weight, but in order to kind of decrease inflammation and get um, kind of all the metabolic issues and hormonal dysregulation issues that weight is like a symptom of, right? And so what I always tell all of our potential clients is I'm like, if I talk to almost everybody before they come in is like, you know, you may have come to me because you want to lose weight, but that's not our focus. Our focus is helping you how to, how to create sustainable health behavior change um, for the long term. And if you lose weight, it's a great side effect. <laughs> um, and they, and they do, they do do all of the above. So, um, that's, that's us in a nutshell. Um, the, the, um, we have group programs, we have personal programs, we do some fitness and culinary programs as well, but that main program is the one that we work on the most. Um, and at this point I have 12 coaches working for me, doctors, nurses, dietitians, um, and what we do kind of on our initial calls we do free strategy calls with people and they come on and talk to me or a couple or my teammates do it as well. And we just really try to dig into, you know, where they are, where they want to be and try to help them figure out which program is best for them or if it's even somebody else, but we can pick through that conversation knowing our coaches so well, like who would be the perfect mindset coach? Is it the hypnotherapist or is it the doctor life coach, right? Or who's going to be the best, you know, weight coach? Is it, you know, nurse Katie, because she's got two little kids around the same age and, and help with meal planning, or is it the dietitian? And um, so it's, it's fun to make teams like that and watch them all thrive. Hmm. So the coaches, um, you, you said you utilize various types of roles as coaches. So like physicians could be coaches, dietitians could be coaches, or are those in addition to the coaches as well? No, those are the coaches. Okay. Um, yeah, their their primary jobs may be physician, nurse, dietitian, but working for Holis, they're they're being coaches. 
So you, oh, go ahead, Kevin. I'm just gonna, not, not to delve too much into the super, super nitty gritty details, but I'm just, are these cohort based classes that you're doing or are they kind of staggered enrollment? Oh, that's a great question. We enroll every Monday, actually. Okay. So we talk to people throughout the week, get them all lined up with their coaches and stuff, and then they kind of hit the ground running every Monday. Kind of helps me keep the automations on track, so they just restart every Monday morning. Hmm. Now, you mentioned that your vision, what's going on right now, is only 10% of your grand vision. Um, can you allude to some of kind of your vision without, you know, yeah, no, I'm, I'm much. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just have, you know, st sticking with the theme of team based apparently today, but I have, I have a vision of a company that can help organize in person treatments better than we are right now. Mm -hmm. So what are the things that people need to get down on their health roadmap, like to get to their goals? Who are the people they would need? Are they in medicine? Are they out of medicine? Are they, you know, what type of healthcare are they in? How do we organize people in person in teams to be able to create kind of, you know, we, we're all better with a team, right? right. Um, to get people where they want to go. And so I'm, I think lifestyle medicine is a great um, tool for that because we, you know, we're not integrative physicians, meaning like we're not using acupuncture and all those other things in our practice, but w um, our goal is how do we change habits to create life's to more long-term, uh, you know, health effects. And I think we're, we're open-minded that way on trying to figure out what other team members we might need. Hmm. That's a huge vision too. I mean, when you're, when you're looking at it, the data, like 80% of chronic diseases or more are diseases of lifestyle and behavior mm -hmm. and 70% of healthcare dollars are the treatment of lifestyle diseases. And yet I would, I doubt there are very many physicians that actually know how to treat lifestyle and behavior, <laughs> which, right. which is a coaching yeah. model that you're doing. Well, like 50% of my clients are female physicians, right? Because we, we didn't know all these things and we <laughs> eat to buffer our stress from being doctor moms. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, um, I, I think it's interesting. I, the, I think the big question is, are people willing to put money down when there's no problem, right? So most of the people who are going to want to access teams around their health um, probably don't have a lot of health problems yet, right? They're being proactive. Whereas like, as I was saying, like the, you know, the non-scale victories that people can't get by working with Holist are sometimes even more life-changing than the weight that they lost. But would they have come and put down money to pay for something if they didn't have the weight problem? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that's just because we're, you know, that's just us as humans, right? Like um, you have to be uncomfortable to want to fix it. Yeah. Well, that's the, the whole problem with, I guess uh, maybe outside the scope of this, but this idea that selling to prevention is extremely difficult. Selling people on the idea of to stop something from actually occurring is, is much harder to do than to actually address or create something or, Really, what what our healthcare system is about is is wait for the problem to surface, and then all of a sudden we can attack it with drugs and injections yeah. and all that other stuff. So, um, have, how how are you transitioning in that realm, and how are you how how are you f encouraging people or or persuading people or or demonstrating to people that um, that prevention? I guess how how are you framing and marketing prevention, or are you? Um, I don't think I'm marketing prevention so much uh but when people get on these strategy calls with us you know they're pretty warm to our message because they've gone through a number of homeworks and a number of videos they had to watch and so they kind of get it they already know that this is going to be not like a regular phone call and they get on and people are often like crying in minutes about being afraid that they can't pick up their grandkids or not living long enough for that. And so I think that the people that are being attracted to us have already, like they already foresee the problem that they're trying to prevent, which I think is a little bit easier. I think also, you know, a lot of my, a lot of our clients are 40, 50, 60s. And so they're old enough to be a little bit more realistic about things that are coming. Um, so I think that that helps. Um, I think people people are more willing to spend money to fix a problem than to prevent it. Yeah. 
Well, that's always the dilemma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, people that are listening, if they wanted to reach out to you or um, find out more about your programs, obviously you have 50% physicians that are uh, partaking in what you have to offer. Uh, where would you like to direct them? And I'll put them in the show notes, of course, too. Yeah, our website is www.holisthealth.com. That's W-H-O-L-I-S-T. Um, the name Holist, by the way, is a, a play off of how we name our, our specialties and our professions, anesthesiologist, hospitalist, laborist. So this is whole, whole person care and Holist. Um, I'm also at Holist Health on um, Facebook and Instagram. And if anyone just even wants to just message me on my personal platform, we do a fair amount of kind of strategizing with people over messenger to even see if this is something they want to get on the phone and talk about. So um, and then we have, you know, three strategy calls and be happy to talk to anybody about whatever they need. Awesome. Kevin, any other uh, final questions for this? There's so many more questions. That, um, <laughs> Send them. So many different places we can go with this, but I, I want to be respectful of your time uh, for sure. So, you know, thank you very much for coming on. It was an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Uh, you it, it, it is absolutely remarkable um, how you've applied this ability to manage projects as well as to delegate. And I, I think that is, I, I, maybe it's maybe because it's I'm so crappy at it <laughs> that I'm just like, oh my gosh, you are so good at this. I want, how did you learn these skills? Um, but I, I, I think the listeners out there, there's probably somebody like me who's like, man, I'm so tight and I have to have control over everything. And to see what you've done by ability to delegate, to find good people, to trust good people, uh, and to see, I mean, grant two years of work, but man, that's two years that you've created something that has a huge impact. Um, just, I have to applaud you. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I think one other thing, two, the two, two big takeaways, I think, is for people to think ahead of time about how they don't need to be needed. <laughs> Um, and to, and that is by mastering technology and automation. Um, and so I think that's something that you need to start thinking about really early. Um, I think that the second big takeaway is that, um, everybody needs a coach. Like I did not, I did, I did not become successful with this business on my own. And when my revenue turned last summer, it was because I finally invested in getting coaching for me. And that's on marketing and on business and on sales and like all these things that I thought I could teach myself when in fact, again, I just needed someone else who'd already was an expert in it to tell me the things that I needed to learn and work on. That's, that's very different than hiring out your marketing and your sales, right? It's, it's learning it so that you understand it and it's your voice and it feels authentic because it is. Um, and then you can teach your team to do those things, right? Or oversee someone to do those things better than just having outsourced it and had someone do your social media for you, right? Like it just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Well, at least. Uh, well, that, that makes sense. No one, if you're going to be a surgeon, it's not like you're just going to learn surgery on your own. You have to have a mentor or someone to coach you through that process. Yeah. Do it in so many other areas. It's like, well, do it in this new thing. Yeah. Like I had this epiphany where I was like, Oh, right. There were people in college who were majoring in business and marketing, right? Like, this is what they do. Like, why am I trying to do this all on my own and wasting all this time and money, right? And, um, and like, yeah, so th th those are my suggestions, things to think about for listeners who are wanting to start their own businesses. Well, I think that's a, a perfect place to, to end on. I think those are incredibly important points and uh, it's good to have a coach. Um, remember, there are people that might know more than us, <laughs> even though we got through medical school, there's so much more to learn, um, you know, and, and you have really, I think, um, demonstrated whether it's from Idaho to East Africa, that you can take a mission and a goal and put that project into action and, and utilize all these amazing, you know, automations and accessing the online world and, and reach out and, and help more people than we can just one-on-one -on -one, um, and trading our time for money. So um, thank you again for, for joining the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. Yeah.
And for those listening, this is the Change Physician Podcast. I'm Dr. Melissa Cady, joined by my co-host, Dr. Kevin Kakaro, and we will see you at the next episode.